Alright, hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my July reading wrap-up. Without any further preamble or ado, let's get started. So, my first book was Inferno by Dan Brown. Now, I'm not exactly the biggest Dan Brown fan, although obviously I've read to this point in the series. This is, this is kind of why I read this, is because I've read... Brown's like first two books and then the Robert Langdon series up to this point which includes Angels and Demons and the Da Vinci Code and basically I picked this up for uh, the My Cat Picks My TBR videos which I'll link to the playlist below and I kind of eventually I turned it into my bedtime book and the problem was that to begin with for the first hundred pages I really wasn't getting on board with it and it's just the same setup as the previous ones although the the uniqueness in this is that Langdon has uh, like some amnesia which just I, it's a trope that I don't like and it didn't need to be in there really or rather it did because the story wouldn't have worked without it and I feel like that's quite a weak link in it you know but there was some cool stuff in this basically the idea is that uh, somebody's really worried about overpopulation this kind of evil genius and so he's created this virus which he says is going to solve things and it's it's interesting because it raises these like moral questions in your own head like what are we going to do about overpopulation and uh, there's kind of a solution proposed in this and then a very interesting ending so it is worth reading for that the first half of the book was pretty weak the second half of it was all right overall I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5 which is just what I give to like any that's my like my default rating you know but at least I've ticked it off. Then I read Everything's Eventual by Stephen King. So I'm just continuing to slowly but surely work my way through all of Stephen King's books. Uh, there are 14 stories in this. What I think is cool is that he determined the order of them by um, getting some cards and shuffling a deck of cards. And it mostly works. Uh, we start with Autopsy Room 4, which I actually think is one of the strongest. It's about this, this guy is conscious on the autopsy table. And these doctors are performing an autopsy on him. And he has no way of communicating with them. And so, it's, as you can imagine, it's quite tense. Uh, we have The Death of Jack Hamilton's an interesting one. I think that was uh, his take on John Dillinger. So there's this, this like conspiracy theory that it wasn't really John Dillinger who died. Because, the, you know, the corpse looked quite gaunt and had this new scar over his lip and stuff. And so, in this story, King kind of explains why that is. Everything's eventual. The title story actually wasn't that great or memorable. Uh, there is one called The Road Virus Heads North. That's about kind of a haunted painting almost. This guy buys it from a jumble sale and the painting moves and he realizes that this guy in this car in this painting is following him or you know through across the states although i did get a uh, deja vu reading that i felt as though i'd read it before uh, there's also lunch at the gotham cafe as well which is quite brutal to be honest but uh, very interesting as well it's basically about this couple who are divorcing and then there's a mad chef uh, but then the last two riding the bullet and the lucky quarter weren't particularly interesting so I don't know as with any short story collections there were there were hits and misses but overall I did enjoy reading it and I gave it a pretty solid four out of five up next we have film it cuts four title pending by Ollie Jacobs this is another short story collection It's by an indie author if I can get the perspective right on this we might be able to <laughs> uh, Yes, yeah, so Ollie is probably one of my favourite indie authors he's local to me here in High Wycombe and as I say this is short stories although there is like also kind of poetry but it's kind of humorous poetry so for example the ballad of Bert Thundercock Jones I reviewed this in depth for uh, Tarden Danes indie read along so I'll link to that below but yeah it was pretty good it's not as good as that the first film it cuts book was phenomenal and I think he's been trying to chase that success ever since but you know it was one of my top books of the quarter so I would be doing the same if I was him you know it's very difficult to write at that higher standard constant you know constantly so overall I gave that one, that's another 3.5 out of 5. Here we have Lock and Key Volume 6, Alpha and Omega by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. So this is the last of the six volumes that bring together the Lock and Key sort of comic slash graphic novels I suppose. And it's all about this mansion uh, where these keys can be used to do different things. So for example there's a key that allows you to open up your head and you could literally put an encyclopedia inside your head and you would gain all of that knowledge. So it's kind of cool how all these different keys come about and then we've been teased about the Omega key all the way through and then this this edition kind of finally deals with that and also just wraps things up with, at the end. And uh, yeah, this is probably one of the stronger volumes. I give it a 4 out of 5. The series overall was probably like a 3.75 average with some high points, some low points. But uh, yeah, I'm glad I read it. I read that with my other half as well and she enjoyed it too. Probably more than I did. 
Here we have Dashiell Hammett, The Dane Curse. So I picked this up. This is actually a bedtime read. I have been trying to slowly read through all of Hammett's stuff. He's like known for writing hard-boiled detective stuff. He wrote the uh, the the novel The Maltese Falcon, which then became like a really well-known sort of noir movie. But in this one, it was much more sort of paranormal. And considering it's literally got my name in the title, uh, I just, it didn't really work, and it also felt, again, this is another one where it felt more like a lot of different short stories rather than one overall novel, to the point at which I was reading it in bed, and I was like, I don't know what's happening, I don't know what's happening, I don't know what's happening, and then like in ten pages, there'd be like one throwaway mention, reference to something, and I'll, I'll be like, oh, I remember that happening, and then I'm back to, I don't know what's happening, I don't know what's happening, so it's uh, two out of five for me, unfortunately, it just didn't grip me at all. And uh, yeah, a bit of a disappointment. It's kind of made me hesitant to pick up more Hammett now as well. Okay, here we have Agatha Christie NRM. So I've been on a bit of a Christie hype this month, as you will see. This is a Tommy and Tuppence book. Uh, so there are only five of those. Those are like uh, other detectives other than Marple and Poirot. What's interesting about Tommy and Tuppence is they aged in real time. So as Christie aged, so too did the characters, which I think is quite cool. So by the end, the last one, they're, they're, you know, they're both really old, but... Uh, in this one, this is set during the uh, Second World War, and they're basically tasked with, like, um, well, let me read you the blurb is the easiest way to do it, because it's, it is, it's kind of like an espionage thriller almost, and a bit different to the other stuff that she's read, but it worked really well, I thought. It is World War II, and while the RAF struggles to keep the Luftwaffe at bay, Britain faces an even more sinister threat from the enemy within, Nazis posing as ordinary citizens, or well, they're also called the Fifth Column. With pressure mounting, the intelligence service appoints two unlikely spies, Tommy and Tuppence Beresford. Their mission? To seek out a man and a woman from among the colourful guests at San Susi, a seaside hotel. But this assignment is no stroll along the promenade. N and M have just murdered Britain's finest agent, and no one at all can be trusted. So yeah, I gave this like a probably a... Yeah, I'll give it a four out of five. Uh, a lot of people don't like the Tommy and Tuppence books, but I, I've just always been a fan of them, really. They're pretty good. Here we have The Diabolical Club by Stephen Colgan. Uh, Stephen Colgan's another High Wickham author. This is actually out through Unbound. So I pledged my support, and there's a list of supporters at the back, and I'm in the list, and it also meant that I actually got this ahead of its general release. Uh, this is actually the second book in a series. The first one was called A Murder to Die For, and they basically take place in this kind of fictitious ver version of England, uh, like Little England, where, like, uh, you know all the little villages and stuff like that stuff like in um, Midsummer Murders and that kind of thing and it, it follows uh, the goings on to do with this crime writer called Agnes Crabb who's obviously like an Agatha Christie style writer uh, she's long dead but at, in the first book there's a murder at like a, a festival to celebrate her writing and in the second book one of her missing manuscripts is discovered so I think it's quite cool how that links it all together there was also a reference in this to Ariadne Oliver uh, one of the characters had a book by her and she's a fictional writer from the Agatha Christie universe which is very cool I know all in all I just yeah it's a lot of fun it's like a funny cozy mystery novel you know I get this a four out of five good stuff and I'm looking forward to Colgan's next okay then we have Amsterdam by Ian McEwan so I read this as a bedtime book uh, my other half I think is kind of an Ian McEwan fan this is the only one of his books that I've read it's the first one picked it up from a charity shop and I didn't like it to begin with, I just wasn't on board with the writing style, and I, I thought the characters were very dull characters as well. I, I think you're not supposed to like them, but it's not particularly plot-heavy, and when it's focusing a lot on the characters and you don't like the characters, it gets kind of difficult to slog through it. About halfway through, I started to enjoy it a little bit more, and I did kind of get into his writing style, but then the ending just absolutely ruined it for me. Basically... For me, this has a really harmful message about euthanasia and assisted suicide, and especially, I mean, it's the winner of the 1998 Booker Prize, so when this was coming out, this would have been kind of, I suppose, more in the early days of things like that, and things like Dignitas, and just for me, as someone like, I know how difficult it is to be euthanized, and like, I've read a lot of Terry Pratchett's stuff writing about it, because obviously, when he was um, diagnosed with, with his illness, Basically, he was worried that it would get to the point when he'd no longer be able to be sufficiently con in control of himself to be euthanized, but that was what he wanted. And so the argument is, is actually people are basically being euthanized too early because they can't rely on the fact that once they are past this point of no return, that other people will, you know, will, can be relied on to do it for them. And in this, you've got people basically 
using euthanasia as a murder weapon and it's just like I, I really don't think that's healthy and not a good thing to bring to the discussion like if people could read this book and then go on to vote against euthanasia just because of this book and I'm just like not cool man here we have the story of Brexit by J.A. Hazley and J.C. Morris J.P. Morris sorry and uh, this is just another one of those little ladybird books for adults I'll read you a couple of pages a lot of the arguments for staying in Europe were not very convincing some people called it Project Fear but sometimes you have to take a risk for good things to happen. Here we've got a uh, Montmorency de Douche Lord Ponsonby Fring and his friend Sir William de Flournay were glad the public voted leave. Like so many landowners, newspaper barons, hedge fund managers, firebrand backbench MPs, expat billionaires and Russian oligarchs, they thought it was high time the ordinary people of Britain got a chance to send a strong message to an out-of-touch elite. Figury lives in Islington. He is a parliamentary private secretary at the Department for Exiting the European Union. He has spent the last two years enacting the will of the people. It is not the will of any people he actually knows, so he has not really done much towards it. Someone will work it out, he says to himself. They usually do. Very accurate. Probably uh, four out of five, I think. Here we have In Real Life by Neve Shulman. Love lies in identity in the digital age. Neve Shulman is the host of MTV's Catfish. And in this, he kind of tells his own story, but also shares some advice on how you can stay safe online. So in that respect, it reminded me of my book, Social Paranoia, how consumers and brands can stay safe in a connected world. But um, also what I didn't realize is that he used to be a bit of a wrong and like he was selling weed and magic mushrooms. He was a bit of a womanizer. Uh, you know, he got kicked out of college and stuff. And actually after writing my review of this, I saw he'd been suspended by MTV under allegations of sexual misconduct. Uh, I think they've since reinstated him and he's come out to say the woman was lying, which is seems to be what dudes always do. But um, I don't know, after reading this, I would not be surprised, especially if it's some historical stuff. He kind of writes and says that he's changed now, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know the guy, you know? But that kind of left a bit of a sour taste. But overall, it was like a 3.5 out of 5. The actual advice on staying safe was pretty sound. And it was interesting to read his story because basically he was catfished and he made a documentary about it. And then people started emailing him asking for help. And then that's how the TV show was started. All right, up next we have a bit of Fry and Laurie by Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. And this is literally sketches from the A Bit of Fry and Laurie TV show, which is cool because I do really love that show. But on the other hand, like that used to be the thing I fell asleep watching. So reading this gave me the odd experience of it being a reread, even though it wasn't a reread. So my main criticism would just be that it could have done with a bit more. Like there is an introduction. It is, what, six pages long. And then the rest of it was all, all felt like a reread. But still, if you like the TV show, you'll probably enjoy the book. I gave it a probably a 3.5 out of 5 again. All right, then we have another Agatha Christie, Why Didn't They Ask Evans? I might as well read you the blurb because it's a tiny one. It was, a, it was at the 17th hole that Bobby Jones's game fell apart and his ball vanished down the chasm. On the rocks below, he saw the crumpled body of a man and overheard his last words. Why didn't they ask Evans? And hearing those last words would bring Bobby Jones into mortal danger. So I was worried this was going to be a bit like Murder in the Lynx and there was going to be loads of golf stuff that I was going to have to deal with. But other than the fact that that's where the, bod the first body is found, I don't know whether, I can't remember now whether there are more than one body. Um, bodies. <laughs> but other than that, there's not too much about golf in here. Now, I've been reading a few of these recently and these have got tiny, tiny print. I've actually been putting off reading these editions of them. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to cut down on my TBR. I've actually finally got it below 150 now. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd crack on with some of these mini ones. That one was pretty good. It was a 3.75 out of 5. Okay, then we have The Ice Bear by Jackie Morris. I got this from a charity shop. It's a bit hippy-dippy-ish, to be honest. It's like a little children's story with quite a spiritual message. But also, there's these are really beautiful illustrations. Uh, some cute stuff about animals in there as well. And uh, my other half read it as well. I'm, I'm going to read you just like these two pages, I guess, just to give you a, a feel for the writing style. Raven flew over the ice, the length of four canoes. She dropped the treasure and it lay like a flame on the cold white. The boy moved to take it and in flew the bird. It became a dance, boy and raven. As if enchanted by the raven's game, the boy followed the bird, out onto the snow and away from home. It was a while before he looked around and realised that he did not know the way back. The wind had blown a fresh dusting of snow over his footprints. He was lost. So yeah. Up next we have T.S. Eliot, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. Uh, Nicholas Bentley drew the pictures. Now... The pictures are quite cool, and it is about cats, but bearing in mind T.S. Eliot wrote, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. 
it was a bit depressing almost to read these, to be honest. Uh, like, for example, let's read this. McCavity's a mystery cat. He's called the Hidden Paw, for he's the master criminal who can defy the law. He's the bafflement of Scotland Yard, the flying squad's despair, for when they reach the scene of crime, McCavity's not there. McCavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity. He's broken every human law. He breaks the laws of gravity. I mean, it's not bad or anything, and it is a nice little addition. It's just really not the kind of poetry that I know Elliot for, I guess. But uh, yeah, I gave it like a th three, three out of five. All right, then we have another one of these little tiny ones. Agatha Christie, Murder and the Muse. This is actually four short stories. We have, uh, I might as well read these out. Uh, we have The Incredible Theft. Who stole the plans of a new bomber from the home of a cabinet minister? Dead Man's Mirror, a locked door mystery in which a shattered mirror leaves a vital clue. Triangle at Rhodes, Poirot's hopes for a holiday from crime prove over-optimistic. And in the title story, a young widow's death looks like a suicide until Poirot confesses himself mystified by the clues that point to a murder in the muse. And Murder in the Muse and The Incredible Theft, I think, were the two best ones for me. I did actually like The Incredible Theft and this idea of the bomber plans being stolen, although it also felt done as though I'd read it before, which I suppose, I mean, it's kind of similar to, I can think of a few Sherlock Holmes stories like that, for example. But overall, yeah, a good little read, probably a 3.75 out of 5 for this one. Then I read Mrs. McGinty's Dead by Agatha Christie. This is a Poirot novel. Mrs. McGinty died from a brutal blow to the back of her head. Suspicion falls immediately on her shifty lodger, James Bentley, whose clothes reveal traces of the victim's blood and hair. Yet something is amiss. Bentley just doesn't seem like a murderer. Could the answer lie in an article clip from a newspaper two days before the death? With a desperate killer still free, Hercule Poirot will have to stay alive long enough to find out. And so the weird thing about this is that uh, I'd not got this marked as like want to read on my wish list, and like all of Christie's stuff apart from this is on there. And uh, I had heard Mara from books like Woe talk about this recently as well, and then I happened to see it in a charity shop and happened to remember that I didn't have it and then got home and saw that it wasn't on my list. If I checked the list of books I wanted to buy, I would have assumed I'd already got this. So that was a bit of luck. I think what's cool about this is that Mrs. McGinty is almost the main character, even though she's dead at the start of the book. And in that aspect, it reminded me a bit of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, that like all of the book is digging into this dead woman's uh, past and how that kind of affects the present, you know? So uh, yeah, I thought that was really cool and quite unique for Christie, really. So I gave it a 4 out of 5. Then we have Deep Cosmos by Project Kyle. I'll be doing a full review of this for uh, Tarden Danes indie read-along. But basically this is a science fiction sort of middle grade slash YA book. Although there are some kind of brutal moments in it. But it's quite a cartoonish violence. Like you'll get people shot in the head. But you don't, you don't see all the blood and gore and viscera and all this stuff. So I think you could read it as, you know, a young teen. And um, my main criticism would be that it feels like lots of short stories rather than a cohesive whole. But, um, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily a problem, I guess. I also think there's some great representation here for Asperger's Syndrome and for anxiety, which the author himself has. There's some stuff in the back as well, like a little inter interview with the author. And uh, because that, you can tell that wasn't edited and proofread by his editor and proofreader. And that makes you then appreciate how good of a job they've done throughout the rest of the book. For an indie novel, it's pretty high quality. It's not necessarily my kind of thing, but uh, I thought it was well done. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. And then we have Halloween Party by Agatha Christie. And uh, this one apparently doesn't have a blur, but basically a young girl is murdered at a Halloween party. Uh, basically in the UK we do this thing called bobbing for apples, where you have a you know bucket of water and apples floating in it. And with your hands behind your back you have to like dip your face into the water and get the apples out with your teeth. And uh, somebody's basically drowned in an apple bobbing thing, uh, this, this young girl. And then we investigate that, but as well as having Poirot here, we have Ariadne Oliver. And what's really cool is that when they met up, they were like, oh, it's not been too long since we met each other in uh, the, the, the Mrs. McGinty case. And I'm like, I literally just read that. So that's nice that the two of them came together. I know Hannah Tay is also a big fan of this one, and I can see why. And the good thing is you don't need to read it around Halloween to enjoy it. I gave this one a solid... I'm going to give this one a 4.25 out of 5. It was good. All right, I have three more books to update you on. So here we have One, Two, A Book on My Shoe by Agatha Christie. This is a Hercule Poirot book. Uh, Hercule Poirot disliked his dentist, but one of his patients liked Mr. Morley even less and shot him just after Poirot left his office. Was it the mysterious unpleasant Greek? The wild young American who looked like a murderer? The rich banker? Or the ex-actress with the buckle on her shoe? 
And uh, I really enjoyed this actually. I liked basically Christy doesn't do it much, but every now and then she'll write a book that has like military intrigue or it's like drawing the war or there's some sort of espionage element to it and that kind of happens here but also um, it was interesting because I started reading this the day after I'd booked an, a, a dental uh, appointment uh, just by coincidence I didn't realize that was was what it was about but um yeah I really enjoyed this one probably like 3.75 out of 5 there's nothing to really mark it up above other Agatha Christie novels but um probably one of the, the better ones that I've read this month and as you as you can see I've read quite a few of them. Then I read Curiosity by Paul Jenkins. So this was sent to me as like a belated birthday present from Time for Books here on YouTube, on Booktube, so thank you. And um, this was described on the back by Mike Carey, who's MR Carey, as uh, a redemptive myth for a mythless age. Clearly Paul Jenkins is a pseudonym for Lewis Carroll collaborating with Douglas Adams. For me, it was more like Terry Pratchett collaborating with Douglas Adams, but that was not a problem because Pratchett's one of my favourite authors. I don't want to talk too much about this one because I have actually filmed a full review because I sort of tabbed it out and made a few notes as I was going. But basically it's got this kind of like magical realism vibe. It's similar to Harry Potter in that there's all this magic happening in our world and we just don't know it's there, you know? And in, in this it's because you need to unsee and... In this is because you need to unsee and unlook at things. And then you have this device of like the Museum of Curiosity. So basically it follows this guy who's like a private detective who's hired to, to find a box of levity, which is the opposite of gravity. And uh, the ensuing shenanigans that go on from there. But you get all these kind of cool magical artifacts and uh, it's also just a lot of fun as well. So yeah, I gave this a four out of five and thank you to Time for Books for sending it to me. And then I read Neither Here Nor There, Travels in Europe by Bill Bryson. So Bryson's written a whole bunch of different uh, travel books. I actually really enjoyed Notes from a Small Island, which was about his travels in the UK. And I've been kind of collecting his books, but I haven't picked any up for a while. And I'm a little bit worried after picking this up because it just didn't really connect with me. Like there were moments where his humor was very funny, but basically we're following him on, in his travels around Europe and he kind of just complained his way across Europe. Like he was in Denmark and he was saying, oh, it's too expensive. And then like the next place it'd be too cold and the next place the people are too boring. And it's just like, you know, cheer up. You're, you're on the road, you're traveling and writing a book about it. I, I, I don't know, it was just, what, what the way I kind of summed it up was that Despite it being a book about travel, it didn't make me want to travel. It made me quite glad that I was at home. So uh, I gave it a 3 out of 5. There were some redeeming factors to it. And I did also like the time it was written was sort of late 80s, early 90s. So it was just around the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union and all that stuff. And also just around when I was born. And I've been to some of the cities he mentioned, like Amsterdam and Milan were both in here, for example. So it was kind of cool to read him writing about places that I've been. But yeah, I was just, I think part of the reason for my low, lowish rating for it is just that I was expecting so much more, especially after Notes from a Small Island, and I was just a little bit disappointed. But I will continue reading Bill Bryson. All right, I have two more books to talk about. So first up we have The Dark Half by Stephen King. So this is described here as his masterpiece, and on the rear it says, a masterpiece of imagination from the world's best-selling author. I don't know if it's his masterpiece when you put it up against things like It and The Stand, but it is a very good novel. I would say this is top 15% King. It's also one of the few King novels where the main character is a writer. And I really feel as though it works. In fact, in this one, and Misery is the other one, uh, where I think the fact that the character is a writer works. And the reason that it works is because the plot depends upon them being a writer. So in other ones of his novels, it sometimes runs the risk of feeling as though the characters are just writers because King is a writer. And it's almost... You know, him just putting himself there, being like, okay, this character can just be like a facsimile of me. And, uh, you know, so it does kind of get annoying when you repeatedly get characters who are writers in King's work. Here it worked really well, though. I'll read you the blurb quickly, actually. The sparrows are flying again. The idea, unbidden, inexplicable, haunts the edge of Thad Beaumont's mind. Thad should be happy. For years now, it is his secret persona, George Stark, author of super-violent pulp thrillers, who has paid the family bills. But now Thad is writing seriously again under his own name and his menacing pseudonym has been buried forever. And yet, 
The sparrows are flying again, and something is terribly wrong in Thad Beaumont's world. I thought uh, that George Stark was a great villain in this, especially he uses a razor. There, there was a scene where he slit someone's throat, and because she was a woman afterwards, he closed her eyes as well. But yeah, he's a very violent man. Like Some of the scenes in this were pretty brutal. There's a scene where the main writer stabs himself through the hand with a pencil. So there's quite a lot of violence and gore, and it's also kind of part thriller but also part it's got like supernatural elements to it in that George Stark is kind of a ghost I mean basically uh, Thad Beaumont the writer when he was in the womb he was part of a pair of twins and his embryo absorbed the other embryo which was George Stark and then he had a brain tumor as a kid that was then removed and that was George Stark and then he was kind of writing as George Stark and then kind of killed him off in this fake thing. And so really this third time when Stark comes after him, it is, it's like the third time he's have to, had to kill him. And uh, yeah, I thought like some of the things with the automatic writing and the sparrows, this, this shown here, the sparrows are flying again. Uh, it was all very cool. And uh, yeah, so I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 and would recommend. But for more on this, watch my full review of it. And then we have The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. So this is book one in the Chronicles of Narnia series. I've actually never really read this. I sort of half read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and DNF'd it when I was about eight or nine. And I kind of remember it. And actually I have that next. So I don't know how well that's going to go. But yeah, I uh, picked up a box set of these, all seven of the books for five pounds. I thought it can't go wrong and I've been meaning to get to them. So that's kind of my current project really is to get through the Narnia books. And I'll probably be doing like a video wrap up at the end of them as well. There was a cool scene in it where they're like crawling across these floorboards and going through the attics to get into the different houses. And that actually reminded me of a part of Final Fantasy VII near the start where they're in the church, Cloud and Eris. Let me know if you get this reference. <laughs> But um, all in all, I did quite enjoy it. The overly religious stuff didn't really creep in until the end when suddenly Aslan is God and he's creating Narnia. So then it did get a bit a bit of overkill. But if you just read it as just a children's book, it was quite nice. It reminded me of uh, Enid Blyton's Faraway Tree book. So pretty solid start to this series. And I gave it a 4 out of 5. Oh, Dane from the future here. I accidentally forgot to mention Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett. In fact, hey Biggie. Roar. Look who I've got. There's someone going past, wasn't it, Biggie? What did you think of Feet of Clay, mate? Because you read the book with me, didn't you? Yes, you did. So we read Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett via audiobook. It was very good, wasn't it, Biggie? It was one of my favourite Discworld novels, and uh, it was actually the first one that I read as well, and so it was nice to go back to it and to revisit it all. It's basically it's the City Watch, the Ankh Morpork City Watch, and they investigate a crime where somebody's been found murdered. Uh, the title Feet of Clay comes from the fact that it's all golems who are all involved in it. And we get to see some new officers joining the City Watch as well. So we get uh, Cheery Little Bottom, who is a dwarf. And we get this like whole sort of feminism storyline because basically she's a dwarf. And in like in dwarfish culture, there's sort of no difference between men and women. So women can do all the things that men can do. They can do mining, you know, they can quaff mead and they can do all this stuff. What women can't do is wear high heels and, um, you know, lipstick and things like that, or express their femininity. So we almost have this, like, opposite to our, uh, like, women's liberation movement or whatever, where, in our reality, women wanted the vote. They wanted to do traditionally masculine things. They wanted to, you know, equal pay, uh, equal access to jobs, which arguably were still lacking with things like STEM and all, the, all that kind of stuff. But, um... In the Discord, it's the opposite. The women already have equality as far as that goes, but they're not able to express their femininity, at least as dwarves. And uh, she ends up, uh, you know, hanging out with Constable Angua, who is a werewolf as well. And there are some great, great lines in it, like, uh, uh, for example, she, because she's a werewolf, she always has this nagging feeling that she should be wearing three bras, because obviously, when she's in her wolf form, she has uh, six teats. Can we say teats? I think if we say what they are, which is nipples, this video will probably get demonetized, but hey, whatever. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite Discworld books. I gave it a five out of five and I did a full review of it, which I will link to below. And that is now my wrap ups concluded. 
All right, well, there we have it. Those are all of the books that I read in July. So, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.